Tuesday marks the first European equities on offer, but there is a huge bid coming into the European bond market. We'll deal with the details in just a moment. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. So we're seeing selling in equities, but the real action, as I say, is in the bond market here in Europe. 29 minutes to go to the equity market close, but the focus firmly on what is happening in the Govy market. Germany, let's take a look. These are all 10 years. Let's take a look at the German 10-year yield, the Bund, down by 18 basis points. A huge bid coming in. Take a look at OATs, the French market. Uh, we're down by 21 basis points, now, now yielding uh, spot 38. German 10-year back in negative territory. BTPs, 141. We're down by 29 basis points. But you can look at the twos, the fives and the tens, Kaylee. Huge action across the European government space right now. And there's a lot of action in the bond market here when it comes to Treasuries, Guy. The moves quite aren't quite as large, but still, they are sizable. The 10-year yield at this point is down by about 10 basis points. 172 is where we sit, but you are seeing more movement in the shorter end of the curve. That two-year yield up 12 or down 12 basis points to 131. Of course, this is as we're seeing a repricing as well of Federal Reserve expectations. The market now taking off the idea that 50 basis points could be a reality at the meeting this month. Now they're just looking for 25. And as far as the equity markets go, we are seeing them right around session lows. The S&P 500 is down by about eight tenths of one percent. But equities really seem to be taking a backseat to what we're seeing in the bond market as well as the commodity market today, Guy. And that is evident too in oil. WTI crude now up nine percentage points. 104.52 is where we're trading even after that Bloomberg reporting that the IEA is going to release 60 million barrels of crude from the strategic petroleum reserves of the U.S. and other countries. Doesn't seem to be having an impact at all on what's happening in terms of oil prices, Guy. Brent crude up by 8% now on the session. WTI, as you say, 9%. These moves are eye-watering. Um, but the bond market front and centre. Let's take a look at what is happening in the UK. The market now pricing in, pricing out, sorry, 50 basis points in the Bank of England next month. Uh, you take a look at the Italian five-year, down by 31.4 basis points. I say down, this is a huge bid that is coming back into the bond market here in Europe. So let's talk about what is happening. What is the market signalling here? Christine Aquino, Bloomberg Markets editor, joining us now. What's going on? Well, Guy, I think there is this big realization in markets today that whatever is going on in Russia and Ukraine is not going to be great for Europe. And, you know, I think it's taking some time for the markets to realize that and kind of for that to flow through, of course, because we've been focusing on kind of the, the news that's coming more immediately from Ukraine and Russia. But I think now that the dust is settling a little bit, I think people generally are realizing that this will have very big, very negative implications for European assets. We're looking, of course, at the move in bonds, the pairing back in ECB rate hike bets. I'd like to add as well what we've been observing in the euro, which is an increase in hedging that downside. Christine, thank you very much indeed. Great coverage on the Bloomberg terminal as to what is happening with the European bond market story. Let's talk about another bond market story. Ukraine just raising around $277 million in a sale of war bonds. It's the country's latest fundraising effort to tap into global support in its fight against the Russian invasion. Joining us now from Ukraine is Yuri Butsa, Ukraine Government Commissioner for Public Debt Management. Sir, thank you very much indeed uh, for taking the time to talk with us on what is a hugely significant day for your country. Can you just walk me through the level of support that you've received today, was it as much as you'd hoped for? Where did it come from? Uh, thanks for coming here and greetings from Ukraine. Uh, so uh, just to put it in the context, right, we didn't have uh, bond auctions in this type of environment before. Uh, so it took us some time to put the systems up and running. Uh, so I wouldn't say we had any expectations for this auction. We launched this instrument today. And getting short of $300 million was already a good achievement. Uh, but what is more important, that our mailboxes are full with the requests from international investors how to get to those bonds. And um, with that, we're going to continue printing this instrument, but we need to sort out some bottlenecks, which are mostly, I would say, on the 
primary dealers or bank side at the moment of time. Our systems are up and running and our treasury operations are up and running. But we're going to continue. We see that a good outcome. We see that we can test that even in current environment, we can conduct our debt operations and uh, we're going to continue further. Commissioner, this is Kaylee in New York. Thank you for giving us some of your time. It's good to say, uh, see that you are safe in Ukraine. Do you plan to raise any more funds, more war bonds, perhaps priced in foreign currencies, dollars, euros? We discuss uh, multiple options at the moment of time. Obviously, the number one priority for us is the concessional funding, and we have massive support on that front. Our minister was today speaking on the G7 ministers of finance meeting. And we expect the outcomes of those meetings to materialize in the emergency financing for Ukraine. Uh, but we also had investor activity. We had investor call yesterday, and we see a lot of requests, a lot of requests how, yeah. how funds can support us. So we are looking at the way to attract not only in local currency, but also in dollars and euros, potentially also with U.S. guarantees or any other types of guarantees. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure we are in the position to have a standalone issue in there, but we will explore all the options at the moment of time we have. Currency controls are currently in place. How big a problem are those? Uh, look, currency controls are in place due to the obvious reasons, but they are one way, right? So uh, it's hard to expatriate, it's pretty much impossible at the moment of time. We still look at this as a short-term measure once the situation normalizes and Russian troops are withdrawn. Uh, but if there are no problem to invest the facts in Ukraine. So uh, their exchange rate is there, central bank can provide uh, green liquidity, and we can obviously channel it through the bonds to the treasury operation. Commissioner, Ukraine had just under $300 million of dollar bond coupon payments due today. Have international investors uh, received those interest payments? Has that cleared? Yes, yes. We all, as we said, and we were always vocal for the last five years, uh, that we honor our debt obligations. So that was, to the best of my knowledge, it is in the clearing systems already. I'm not sure whether all investors got their proceeds already just because of the nature of the clearing systems operations, but those funds, those funds were released from Ukraine already fully. In terms of what your funding requirements are right now, what are you going to be using this money for? How much additional funding do you need? I'm just curious as to the planning that you're now putting in place, the timeline that you're working on. How are you thinking about this? Look, it's, it's a very interesting exercise because uh, your planning moves from a yearly planning to pretty much up to a month planning now. So we, uh, we collect uh, revenues, obviously, and we calculate how much of uh, the downfall on the revenue collection we're going to expect because of business activity slowed down due to the obvious reasons. Uh, in terms of spendings, we prioritize, uh, first of all, uh, defense spendings, uh, but also pension salaries, especially for the healthcare workers. So we try to pay all the payments, priority payments from the budget. So the gap is obviously widening. I cannot give you any precise numbers, but at uh, the moment of time, the more we can get in terms of support, the better it is. Commissioner, so what else would you like to see from the West? We've seen countries pledging to provide weapons, to provide funding. What does Ukraine need? Look, this support is already super helpful. So I would say that uh, two things uh, which in generally are needed. First of all, uh, as much support to Ukraine as possible to uh, go through these uh, uh, conditions, both military and financial. And from, say, from another side, um, the, as much pressure as possible on Russia. We see that they already start suffering a lot uh, in terms of markets yeah. closure and uh, sanctions. And pretty much the, the, the whole game is how long we can, we can last and we will last for, 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 uh, for as long period of time as we can and how quick they can, uh, de they can be defeated uh, through all these measures. Our military is strong. Our financing should be backed up from the, from the partners. And then uh, that's the recipe for being. Commissioner, just picking up on that point that you, that you raised about Russian assets, what, do you, what is your message? What would your message be to global investors that currently have Russian assets in their portfolios, be they bonds, be it credit, be it equities within their portfolio? What would you say to those investors? I would say, guys, treat those assets like North Korean or Venezuelan assets. So just get rid of them, get them out of the indexes, get them out of, uh, downgrade them in rating agencies. So just Treated as the most toxic stuff you saw in your life, and that will help a lot.
because it is indeed the most toxic, toxic stuff which is out there now. In terms of the conversations Ukraine is having, has your government had any conversation with the IMF about financial aid? Absolutely. Look, IMF, uh, it's unfortunate a bit because we started the IMF review exactly the day before Russian invasion and attack. Uh, so we are now discussing emergency programs with them. We cannot continue the regular program as of now. But two, our two biggest partners in terms of the coordination effort of other, other countries and other partners is actually IMF and the World Bank. So we are looking at the emergency facility from the IMF. We are looking at the emergency support programs from the World Bank, and we expect all our partners from other countries to, to, to back up those ones. One of the obvious options is actually additional SDR allocation from, uh, from the G7 countries and other Western countries. You know that after uh, the SDR distribution, which happened in August last year, uh, a lot of countries got enough of uh, those instruments, and they pledged some of those for the countries in need. But I think there can be a special pledge for Ukraine in the current circumstances, and it will also help us a lot. Commissioner, you, you talked a, a moment ago about the fact that you're planning on a very different timeline. Is it even possible at this point to think about how you're going to rebuild your country and how you could refinance the country and how you could finance some of the reconstruction that is going to be necessary. Is that even a conversation that you're having within your group right now? Well, we have two-stage approach. First, we need to win the war and uh, finance us through this period of time. Obviously, the second stage will be rebuilding what is, what is currently being damaged by Russia. And you know that they are desperate to get advanced on land, so they're shooting our infrastructure from the air at mass. Uh, and once we are done with the first task, obviously, we'll come to the second one and we'll calculate what is the damage. And I would expect that to be covered with the ground financing rather than borrowing. And finally, Commissioner, as you are in Ukraine, can you just give us your read on the situation on the ground there? Yes, to the extent possible, I'm not a a big military expert, but everyone in Ukraine has to be one now. Uh, so uh, what I can tell you is that Russian army didn't uh, didn't advance and capturing any major city or town. They passed by some of very small ones. And even uh, in those ones, people are opposing them being present there. But you also notice that they are very much demotivated in the way. So a lot of people uh, were just put, put there, telling them they go uh, for like military training and people will welcome there, which is not the case, and they are being just simply shut down. So uh, on the ground, uh, we, we, we stand firm. Uh, they try to hit us over the border with the missiles and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, um, at the moment of time, our, uh, that the, the one picture from today I can point you to, there were lines to the ATA machines in Russia and lines in Ukraine to the place that they could get uh, rifles. So that's, that's the difference in terms of the impact and perception on the ground. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your time today during a very trying time, of course, for your country. Yuri Butsa, Ukraine Government Commissioner for Public Debt Management. We sincerely appreciate it. Now coming up, we'll have more on the invasion of Ukraine as Russia regroups. Oksana Otonenko of Control Risk Group will be joining us next to discuss. This is Bloomberg. We have proven our strengths. We have proven that as at a minimum, we are exactly the, the same as you are. So do prove that you are with us. Do prove that you will not let us go. Do prove that you indeed are European. And then life will win over death. We're willing, if necessary, uh, and I'm, I think it will be necessary, uh, to go further. There is plainly more to be done on SWIFT. Uh, we can tighten up yet further on SWIFT, even though it's had a dramatic effect already. I think we, we do need to go further. There's more to be done on, on spare bank, uh, more to be done on the freezing of Russian assets. Prime Minister Johnson and, of course, the Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, speaking a little bit earlier today. This is the EU discusses more sanctions against Russia. A top Russian official also appearing to push back very aggressively on some comments that we had a little bit earlier on 
from Bruno Le Maire, the French finance minister. Let me just bring you these comments because I thought the, the reaction from, from Medvedev in Russia was, was fascinating and swift. Bruno Le Maire talking and saying this earlier, we will bring about the collapse of the Russian economy. Medvedev coming straight back. Economic wars often turn into real wars. A significant threat being made against Western Europe. Let's bring in now Oksana Antonenko, Director for Global Risk Analysis at Control Risks Group. Thank, very much, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let's talk a little bit about what happens next. We see the West, we see Europe, we see America stepping up and deliver, delivering significant sanctions that are really starting to hurt Russia. Russia is trying to calculate its response. Is there a danger that we are cornering Russia and as a result of which its way forward is likely to become increasingly aggressive? Is that what we're now seeing on the ground? Well, I think it's a very good question, of course. You know, indeed, we're seeing a much more aggressive uh, uh, rhetoric coming out of uh, uh, Russia. Uh, in terms of its actions, yes, uh, we're seeing, of course, uh, potential shift or you know, beginning of what they call the phase two of their military operations. Uh, we see very large uh, numbers of uh, uh, weapons uh, and equipment and troops that are moving towards Ukraine's capital, Kiev. And there's a lot of concerns that there might be um, a serious and, and, and high casualty uh, indiscriminate attack uh, on Ukraine's capital. But at the same time, we've also seen that Russia has reached out to Ukraine and proposed the talks. These talks, you know, although have not really delivered, yeah. these five talks have not really delivered any outcome so far, but uh, by yeah. all the looks, they were substantial. And the next round is happening very soon again. At least that's what the planning is. So clearly, yeah, but Oksana, I think on the Russian side, rhetoric Oksana, very harsh, but, but maybe not so much progress on the ground. Well, if I could just jump in here, talks to this point haven't seemed to yield anything, just like the sanctions put in place thus far haven't seemed to actually mean any meaningful change in Russia's behavior here. Can anything at this point? Is it only energy? And what would bring that actually to the table, if it's on the table, make the Europeans in the West take that action? Well, from what we can see at the moment, President Putin is not susceptible uh, to any external pressure, be it economic or uh, political or even military. We've seen, of course, his statement about uh, the, uh, bringing you know, his nuclear uh, forces on high alert. But at the same time, of course, people around him in Russia, the economic elites in particular, you know, are, are seeing very substantial impact for sanctions because they are exceeded all the expectations uh, in their severity and they are already very substantially disrupting the Russian economy, particularly the action of freezing, you know, access to Russian reserves. Uh, and uh, the, the, the statements today coming out from Russian government saying that, you know, all the major uh, Russian state enterprises need support, many companies need support. So it is clear that uh, uh, now the population, you know, queuing for hours uh, for, to, to, to access their cash, yep. the, the disruption of payments, all of that is impacting the population, but have not so far impacted President Putin's decision making. Oksana, very briefly, 30 seconds, how do we manage an exit? How do we manage an, a, a route out of this for Vladimir Putin? Is that possible at this stage, that we can defuse this situation? How do we offer him a way out? Well, the 30 seconds answer is at the moment we do not see any way out. It seems to be that he is determined uh, to push, press on with military solution. But uh, clearly we will see very, very soon whether he succeeds. At the moment he failed to take any of the Ukrainian cities. So uh, it is very likely that Ukraine will effectively resist and he would have to rethink very soon. Oksana, we will leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your brevity. Oksana Antonenko of Control Risks Group, thank you very much indeed. Um, huge moves in Europe today, just reflecting the risk that this represents to Europe. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Zalando are falling today. Europe's biggest online retailer is expecting the invasion of Ukraine to have some effect on its business. We spoke with its CFO, David Schroeder. We are truly shocked by the events unfolding in Ukraine. Our hearts and minds are with the people in Ukraine. And obviously, we do our best uh, to support our employees uh, who are either 
directly or indirectly affected with their friends and families. Uh, apart from that, as you already mentioned, uh, we definitely see some indirect impact on our business, particularly our business in Eastern Europe, where we are present in eight markets in total. And what we've seen over the past couple of days that for obvious reasons, uh, customers are not so much focused on uh, shopping fashion anymore, uh, but are now more concerned of what's going to happen uh, in the Ukraine and the neighboring countries. Well, you mentioned that you're active in eight markets in Eastern Europe. Did you have any expansion plans into Ukraine or Russia? And if you did, what happens to those now? Do you have to put those on hold? We didn't have any expansion plans into Ukraine or Russia uh, on the table. We definitely plan to expand further in Eastern Europe, though. And with regards to these plans, they are progressing. But we are obviously, given the current situation, adopt more of a wait and see approach and uh, define the, the final launch schedule, depending on how the events unfold. The other narrative that obviously financial markets are watching so carefully at the moment is what is happening with inflation. Today we've seen very strong inflation data out of Spain, out of Italy, uh, out of parts in Germany as well. Is this inflated um, sort of picture starting to have an impact in terms of the way that consumers are behaving? Is it having an impact in the types of goods they're shopping for, the amount of good they're shopping for? Well, for sure, we see inflation impacting yeah, essentially all parts of Europe and also all sectors. Uh, for our sector in particular, uh, we expect uh, prices to increase in the mid to high single digits, um, which hasn't happened in fashion for a while now, for more than a decade, actually. Prices have been rather stable or even slightly uh, declining. I think we uh, need to see how consumers are going to react to that. Um, and therefore, that's definitely one of the, of the things that we are closely monitoring. At the same time, though, we think that with our platform business model, we are uh, well positioned uh, to also adapt uh, our offer to whatever cu customers are looking for. And that should give us a good opportunity to also continue to show strong growth in this environment. David Schroeder, Zalando CFO, speaking to Kaylee and I a little bit earlier on. The close is coming up next. We've got a lot to talk about. This is Bloomberg. Cash equity trading about to conclude here in Europe. The numbers are brutal on the downside, but actually the biggest market action is coming elsewhere. But let's talk about what is happening here in Europe first up. Um, a sea of red, so equity markets are down and down hard. The DAX is down by 3.5%. The CAC's down by nearly 4% right now. The FTSE 100 continues to hold up, but that's in relative terms. It's down by 1.75%. Then I want to take you to Austria. The Austrian market is down by 6.5% today. I'll take you to Raffheisen in just a moment, but it's not just Raffheisen uh, that is suffering right now. Erst is under significant pressure. Lots of other banks certainly feeling the, uh, the pressure that we are basically seeing reflected, I think, in the bond market today. A real change in tone uh, as to the growth, growth outlook for Europe. Um, let me just show you the stock 600. This is the session. We're down by 2.25% right now. Uh, selling early on, bouncing around throughout most of the day, uh, and then pushing down towards session lows as we've come in through to the close, now trading 442. But as I say, equity markets really, I don't think, reflecting today the true kind of shift that we're seeing. I think you have to go to the bond market uh, for that. Take a look at what is happening here. These are the 10 years uh, across Europe. Germany down by nearly 20 basis points. I'm trying to remember the last time that happened. I'm sure Kaylee Lines will know uh, when we last <laughs> saw such a move uh, of this significance. She'll update us in just a moment. Uh, France, the 10-year, the OAT, down by 23, nearly 24 basis points. The Italian 10-year, BTP, is now trading at 1.4. Uh, we're down by 29, nearly 30 basis points today. These are huge moves, reflecting a real reassessment of the growth outlook that we are now seeing in Europe that is changing so much as a result of the conflict uh, that we are seeing in Ukraine unfolding and unfolding in a more brutal fashion uh, today. The stock story looks like this from a sector point of view. Basic resources holding up. The commodity story front and centre. Healthcare is there. Energy up by three-tenths of 1%. All understandable, I think. Bottom end of the market, travel and leisure down once again, but it's travel and leisure that is down today. I'll show you Flutter in just a moment. The betting company being hit hard by what is happening in Ukraine. The auto sector is down, the banks are down, the utilities are down. Remember, some of these European utilities have significant exposure 
uh, into Russia. They clearly have significant exposure uh, when it comes to the gas and the energy markets. Talking of the energy markets, let's take a look at what is happening with Brent right now. That headline coming out uh, about the IEA, that we're looking for uh, more releases of crude around the world. We're going to get the details of that flowing through uh, over the next few hours. But look at crude, 106.14. We're near session highs. Brent crude is up by 8% today plus. It is an absolutely eye-watering move. Let's get back to some of the single stock names. Let's talk about what is happening here. I want to start off with Raffheisen out of Austria, down by another 8, nearly 9% today. The headline crossing the Bloomberg within the last few minutes that the 2021 dividend has been cancelled as a result of the action that we are seeing in Russia and Ukraine. We talked to Zolando a few minutes ago. Their outlook may be a little bit more cautious than anticipated. Talking to the CFO, maybe we are going to see a, a, an impact into the markets that they pushed into over the last few years in Central and Eastern Europe. That stock down by nearly 10%. And I mentioned Flutter yesterday having a very solid day. Today we're seeing the travel and the leisure down. Flutter's down by 13% today. Stricter betting uh, regulations uh, here in the UK and elsewhere. Plus also the impact of what is happening in Ukraine having a meaningful impact on that stock share price, that, that company's share price today. Flutter, Kaylee, down by 13%. All right, so some massive moves on individual equity, some massive moves in the bond market. The answer to that question, Guy, the last time we saw the 10-year German bond yield down 20 basis points in a single day was 2011. So we're talking more than a decade. This is clearly a market that is undergoing some major repricing. Let's get more on this now and bring in Mark Anderson, UBS Wealth Management Global Co-Head co of Global Asset Allocation. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Clearly, the market is reworking some things. Are you reworking your asset allocation? We're certainly looking at a lot of opportunities in the markets right now. So on one hand side, we're trying to think about what are the scenarios that we're investing into? What is the base case, which is one in which global growth still is coming out above average for the year 2022? There's, of course, some negative potential headwinds we're facing with higher energy prices, as we're seeing today, even with the release of these strategic reserves. That could give us a little bit of a negative headwind in terms of overall global GDP growth. But then conversely to that, as you very nicely show, obviously the yields are down. So there's also speculation in markets that we have essentially central banks around the world that are likely to be maybe a bit less aggressive in their tightening this year. But from an asset allocation point of view, I think the way we've been trying to treat our portfolios is one in which we have thought about the negative scenarios which were likely to come through a high oil prices. So we've certainly been trying to be diversified in our exposure uh, for our clients with things such as energy equities, which is what we're holding as our main overweight position on the, on the equity side, balancing that with a number of different portfolio stabilizers, particularly also on the currency side. Uh, around US dollars, a degree of Japanese yen, and even some commodity currencies that could be doing well on the back of higher commodity prices, such as the Australian dollar, which is another thing we have in portfolios for our clients. Mark, the, the idea at the beginning of this year was certainly that Europe was going to outperform. The moves that we're seeing today in the bond market, as you say, this huge move lower in yields, this huge flow into European bond markets suggests maybe that people are questioning that European growth narrative. How significant do you think the hit could be? How does it change the narrative about putting money to work in Europe? I think it's a good question, Guy, and we certainly have seen sort of a, a lot of European bulls out there, and we have certainly been lining up with, with the rest of them. And I think obviously what the market is starting to discount now is a risk scenario that hurts Europe more than other economies through 2022. Outside of a risk scenario, frankly, we'd still be looking at a broadly speaking European economy that grows strongly ahead of its uh, potential. And even if we're not talking about reopening on the back of, say, the, the pandemic being left to some degree behind, we are still likely to see that some of the reopening dynamics, frankly speaking, will be outweighing the negatives of higher energy prices outside of a, of a real tail risk scenario here. So obviously the, the, the European equity bulls, they're probably hiding a little bit in the closets these days, but I would say that there are quite a few scenarios, both in which kind of a strong economic outlook in Europe, relatively easy central bank uh, in Europe relative to other places in the world, strong earnings growth could still actually see European equities doing well towards the end of the year. But the question okay. marks are certainly there at the moment. Well, Mark, you mentioned higher energy 
uh, prices, and we just got the red headline now crossing the Bloomberg terminal. WTI just broke above $105 a barrel. That's the first time that has happened since 2014. And of course, that's even following the news uh, that reportedly the IEA is going to release 60 million barrels of oil from uh, the SBRs of the U.S. and other countries. As you're thinking about in this kind of environment where there's these kind of inflationary pressures, these kinds of geopolitical risks, what serves as the best hedge, the best haven? Frankly speaking, one of the things, and I mean, in a way you're pointing it to it on, in the chart that you're showing right now, has actually been uh, commodities, exposure to broad commodities, energies, et cetera. Because I think one of the reasons that we have liked this type of commodity slash energy exposure, either through equities, currencies, or directly from commodities, is that we have seen kind of in a in a base case where say the the it, it, or in a, maybe in a hopeful case that we see the Ukraine and Russia crisis de-escalate, you'd still have a strong growth backdrop that is actually supportive of commodities. And a lot of reasons we think that commodity price could move higher in the next couple of years. But in a scenario of thing deteriorating, obviously we could continue yeah. to see as we do today, commodity price moving upwards. So frankly speaking, this is a great hedge for portfolios these days. How do central banks deal with that? How should the ECB think about that? We are now actively talking about stagflation. If energy prices are going to move higher from here, that's obviously going to have an impact on headline inflation, but will also have a massive impact on growth. Is stagflation increasingly becoming the base case scenario here? Not really in our view. I, I, I of course, get the logic on a day like today where you could say, well, higher commodity prices uh, acts like uh, attacks on consumers. That's negative on growth. Obviously, headline, uh, headline inflation will be moving higher. But if we start to break it down a little bit, I'd still say that outside of kind of core commodities, there's a lot of reason to think that actually the uh, US CPI report we get on 10th of March is likely to show the, the peak in, in the inflation numbers, in particular when we look at things like uh, like like headline, but also core and within some of the components, be it around used car prices or, or similar. So I think there are good reasons to believe that we will soon be peaking in terms of, of inflation. Uh, but of course, a lot of uncertainty now with these rising uh, commodity prices, that's, that's clear. On the growth front, uh, you will see a little bit of a slowing in growth on the back of these higher commodity prices, which means that the central banks can probably go a little bit less aggressive and exactly like the pricing action is showing us today, they're starting to take out some of the, the hikes in particular from the Fed or the ECB that we had expected a few weeks back. Mark, it's always great to catch up. We really appreciate your time. Uh, Mark Anderson of UBS Welsh Ma Wealth Management, thank you very much indeed. Um, as Mark's been talking, we've come through the auction process. Uh, we are settling out. A sell-off into the close, a little tick higher during the auction, but the numbers on the screen in front of you, as you can see, fairly brutal from an equity point of view. Huge amounts of money flowing out into the bond market today as people seek havens. Uh, the FTSE 100 down by 1.72%. Energy and commodity stocks uh, acting as a counterweight for the FTSE 100, but still down uh, by one and three quarter percent The DAX down by nearly 4%. The Cacurant down by nearly 4%. Absolutely brutal moves in European equities today, as we see, as we've been discussing, yields absolutely tumbling, twos, fives, tens across the piece. We'll carry on the conversation at the top of the hour. Make sure you tune in to Bloomberg Radio's The Cable Show at 5 p.m. here in London, 12 p.m. in New York, live on DAB Digital Radio and on any of your Bloomberg devices. You can catch the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. We'll certainly be kicking around. What has been interesting price action today here, Kaylee. <laughs> and you could say that, to say the least, Guy, and it's not just in terms of equities, it's not just in terms of the bond market, it is also in terms of oil. WTI crude now up nearly 11%, about 10.5%. We are north of $105 for the first time since 2014, even as the U.S. and other major economies are tapping their strategic reserves. We'll talk more about this with the Director of Research at Energy Aspects, Amrita Sen. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, a European close. I'm Rishka Gupta, live in the principal room. Coming up, tune into Bloomberg's monthly series, Chief Future Officer, this episode featuring Macy's CFO, Adrian Mitchell. This is Bloomberg.
Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Ritika Gupta. Russia is vowing to press on with its attack in Ukraine until its goals are met. A large convoy of troops is slowly moving towards Ukraine's capital. Meanwhile, the mayor of the city of Kharkiv says residential areas are being bombed. A United Nations agency is reporting more than 100 civilian deaths and says there could be more. Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. and other major economies have agreed on a coordinated release of oil stockpiles. The International Energy Agency will deploy 60 million barrels from reserves around the world. Russia's invasion of Ukraine pushed crude to above $100 a barrel. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy. Uh, Rudika, thank you very much indeed. Let's talk about what's happening in the energy complex. Uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, announcing counter sanctions uh, as countries around the world pile up, pel pile up penalties against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Bloomberg TV guests weighing in on how energy markets are being impacted. The energy trade is going to be disrupted. It's, this is not going to be a smooth thing. This is an enormous amount of oil that has the potential to be disrupted for potentially weeks. If you start using uh, the SPR early in the multi-year deficit is, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. You need to keep that for the right reasons. We've done that before. It really uh, didn't make a huge uh, uh, impact, I think, over the long haul. There's room, if needed, to put sanctions on Russian oil exports. I think you're going to see, um, in effect, a, a sanction in a sanction on Russian energy just by the behavior of market actors. We'll probably lose 3 million barrels a day of supply. This is an amount that the world can afford to lose to some extent. Much talk of the SPR release. Bloomberg has learned over the last few hours that the US and other major economies have agreed on a coordinated release of oil stockpiles in an attempt to ease soaring oil prices. Since that news broke, though, oil prices have continued to soar. Uh, WTI crude now trading at 105.58. We're up by nearly 10%. Brent crude is trading at 106, spot 76, up by nearly 9% as well. Amrita Sen, Director of Research at Energy Aspects, joining us now to discuss. Amrita, talk me through your perception of the price action. I, we're at 105 now. We're pushing higher and higher. How much higher do we go? I think we continue to go higher till you actually start to get some demand destroyed because first and foremost, one of the reactions you're seeing from the SPR, we've seen this in the past as well, SPRs don't really work when there is such a massive supply disruption. It's peanuts compared to what you're talking about is actual supply disruption. Um, and there are constraints around that, 60 million barrels of which 30 is going to come from the U.S. U.S. already released a bunch of SPR, uh, if you remember, they announced in November. They're releasing it now. And infrastructure is quite constrained. So they're going to struggle to release much more. So that's one thing. But second thing, right now we calculate about 70 percent of Russian exports uh, is not getting touched by anybody. And that's a much, much bigger number. Russia exports about five and a half million barrels per day of crude exports, 70 percent of that currently not reaching buyers because of fears of sanction. Even though energy is not under sanction, the lack of clarity around banking sanctions has just meant that people aren't necessarily buying these cargoes. Okay. So 60 million barrels there, not going to do much of a difference. Okay, so the SPR re reserve release doesn't really mean anything, Amrita. What if we were to see OPEC take more action this week? Do you expect that? No, we're not expecting that. And this is a really tricky situation for OPEC Plus, given Russia is a member country. Uh, but also, if you look through their balances, and again, this, it gets really murky very quickly, because energy isn't under sanctions, technically, Russian supply and demand continues as is, quote unquote, and therefore there is no change to the balances. However, of course, we know due to logistical problems, due to banking problems, it's the trade flows that is really constricted. Now, we do expect once more uh, clarity around these banks that are going to be exempt from SWIFT emerge, we expect China and India to buy more crude. Uh, so I think the trade flows will fix itself. So OPEC plus see this as a temporary geopolitical risk premium in prices. Also remember the potential of Iran coming back. So they do want to stick to the deal right now. There seems to be a growing conversation, a growing frustration maybe amongst some U.S. producers that the administration in Washington is not doing enough to help them, to persuade them to, to alleviate some of the restrictions they face that would allow them to produce more crude. Is that frustration real? Do they want to produce more crude? They've told, their, they've told their investors they're going to be disciplined. How does this get balanced? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Look, at these price levels, even when they pay back their investors, there is enough money to put into CapEx and increase production. Now, we do think U.S. production is growing. I mean, we've seen, yes, the December numbers came out weak, but generally we are expecting about 800,000 barrels per day exit to exit, so December to December growth in U.S. production. But I think the challenges these U.S. producers are facing are more around the long-term legislative changes that the Biden administration has proposed, and those are the ones they want removed because they don't want to produce temporarily and then, you know, some new kind of restrictions come about. So this is a longer battle, so as to speak, because on the one hand, yes, energy prices are very high today. But on the other hand, the Biden administration is still pushing ahead with the green agenda, which mm. and that's where the tension is and which by definition will mean high energy prices. Finally, in, in regard to those higher energy prices, it's, of course, not just oil we're talking about. What's your view on natural gas, Amrita, and if that is properly priced at this point? I mean, look, yes, we are. I mean, we are seeing a lot of the risk premium priced into natural gas as well. Now, again, we're not expecting disruptions from Russia. But again, given the payment issues, we can't rule out some level of overall disruption. And plus, we've seen a lot of the European countries coming out and saying for the medium term, right, that we are going to move away from Russian gas. Now, that puts a very different spin to the medium term prices. But right here, right now, of course, you know, you are going to get elevated oil and gas prices, given just the risks around it, because we still haven't seen the end game played out. All right. And Rita, son of energy aspects, we have to leave it there. But thank you for lending us some of your insight today. This is Bloomberg. President Biden will deliver his first State of the Union address tonight. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew will be hosting our special coverage here on Bloomberg Television, and he joins us now for a preview. Joe, what are you going to be focused on out of the president this evening? It's kind of a kitchen sink kind of a night here. We're wondering, to begin with, what is the balance the president will strike on the war in Ukraine versus inflation and other domestic issues? Of course, those both tie into each other. But this is an opportunity for the president here to stand in front of the American people and, frankly, the world. It's a very unique uh, platform here that only the president gets. He's going to speak at nine. He'll likely speak for the better part of an hour. And he's got a real balancing act here. The tone that he will strike will be incredibly important. How much does he acknowledge the fact that Americans are hurting, that Americans are concerned about the direction this country is going in, that his approval ratings, as we saw last weekend in the ABC poll, are in fact in the 30s. There's another Suffolk University poll that we saw yesterday that shows more than half of Americans think that the United States is in a recession or a depression. This is going to be a story that we see Joe Biden try to tell about what's been accomplished over the last year. He's got to talk infrastructure. He's going to talk covid where we seem to be turning the corner. And one of the big questions I have is whether he will wear a mask when he walks into that chamber tonight, because it is now mask optional in the House, and a lot of lawmakers do not plan to. That'll be interesting. Lots to look out for, Joe. We're really looking forward to the coverage that you and the team are going to deliver. Bluebirds Joe Matthew, our coverage, of course, starts at 8.30 p.m. New York time. Make sure you tune in. Before that, though, let's focus on what is happening in the markets right now. As Kaylee and I have been discussing throughout the program, huge move in terms of the bond market story today around the world. There's the UK 10-year. The yields on the UK 10-year poised for the biggest drop since 1992. The German 10-year down by 21 basis points. The US 10-year down by 13 basis points. Payrolls Friday, Powell before that, mm. Kaylee, Lots to think about. Yeah, of course, ahead of that, before we've even heard from Chairman Powell this week, the market already really rethinking what the Fed is going to do, not just this month, but really what the trajectory could look like this year. And it's not only the bond markets that are on the move. You're seeing it really across asset classes. Oil is remarkable. WTI crude now closing in on $106 a barrel, up nearly 11 percent, even after we got the news that the IEA will be releasing 60 million barrels of oil from the SPRs of the U.S. and other countries. Crude not even paying attention do that at the moment. It is just moves higher from here. You're also seeing some movement in the FX space. Euro dollar at 111.05, the euro weaker by a percentage point. That is the worst day going back since to 2020. And of course, when it comes to the equity market, it seems less remarkable, frankly, in relative to the moves we're seeing in other asset classes. But you're still seeing the S&P 500 off by a little more than one and a half percent. Of course, the finger you can point to a lot of this has to do with the geopolitical situation. What is happening with the invasion of Ukraine coming up? They will be discussing that with former Defense Secretary William Cohen. He'll be joining 
and Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio Guy. Absolutely. I'll be continuing the coverage on Bloomberg Radio uh, with the cable show at the top of the hour on DAB Digital Radio. From Kaylee and from me, this is Bloomberg. <laughs>